you for joining us again today. It is Lunch with Lisa, and it is Wednesday, and it is our 33rd episode in week seven. And we are excited to not only still be here, but we are excited that our viewers found us today. Uh, the great thing about live webinar is that anything can happen. And today, the platform that we generally use, that everybody is used to logging into, I uh, was having some technical difficulties. We need to switch over to Zoom real quick. So we appreciate everybody not only following us today, but bearing with Michael and myself as we adapt to uh, to to working through this platform. Um, also, we have our chat as always. And so we really encourage people to ask questions and to be a part of this discussion. So Michael Grove, you are the chair of landscape architecture, civil engineering and ecology at Sasaki. And I have been absolutely not just fascinated, but obsessed with what you've been doing because <laughs> with the pandemic, it has given us a completely new appreciation for, um, well, everything like, going to the restaurant or going to uh, the grocery store. And now everything has changed and even down to how our food is being distributed and looking at our, uh, just our, our, where we grow our food and where we live and how we live. And suddenly it's different to be in the city than to be out in the suburbs. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. So thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Lisa. So this is something you've been talking about not only for a long time, but you've been working on all over the world. And tell us about some of the things that you're doing in other areas of the world that we're not yet doing in Boston. Sure. Well, we found that access to food and especially issues of food security are something that a lot of innovative cities are starting to think about, especially in Asia as their populations are growing. So in a lot of these countries, you have farmland um, that is traditional kind of mom and pop farms um, but as cities grow, kind of access to those fruits and vegetables are becoming more difficult. There's supply chain issues, the same as we have here. So these cities are starting to think about what they do for their food supply in the future. Mm -hmm. Do we have that picture of Shanghai? If my team could put up the picture of uh, the bill right there. Look at that. Tell us about that, Michael, what they're doing there. Yeah, so in Shanghai, this is pretty exciting. This is a site uh, in the city that used to be single story greenhouses and it was managed by the Chinese uh, Academy of Agriculture. And what they essentially did was research how different plants would grow in a greenhouse environment. They decided that their mission was kind of outdated. They needed to transform into how they could start to feed the future of the city. Shanghai's 23 million people or so. Um, so they asked us to look at a plan to create vertical farms. Uh, and the great thing about vertical farms is that they can produce around 40 to 100 times more crops in this vertical environment than a traditional soil-based farm could. So not only are you moving kind of the greens that you're growing closer to the population that's consuming them, but you're also mm -hmm. able to produce a lot more yield in a lot less space. And, and why is that? For those uh, who have not seen how a hydroponic farm works, can you explain that? Sure. Um, plants essentially grow in kind of a water gel like growing medium where the nutrients are directly transmitted to the roots of the plant. So they can grow in kind of trays, they can be stacked however many high you're willing to go. Uh, you don't need soil, you don't need to worry about weather, drought, flood, anything like that because they're not grown outdoors. They can be grown year round in this greenhouse type environment. You also don't actually need the greenhouse. This building doesn't need to be made out of glass because with um, LED technology and ultraviolet lights, there's the correct spectrum that they can grow in. So you could even grow these in an underground condition. That's like a parking garage. Like a parking garage or an empty warehouse, an empty department Easy. store. Yeah, lower level of a building. And sure. you know, one of the things that we're talking about is retail space right now. And how could we transform retail space that may have empty stores or even the empty big box, right? If the Sears isn't there any longer or the Macy's, how could we transform an entire space to be something that people would not just be able to come to, but they could pick their own food or it could be the produce for the store that's there or the, um, the property table restaurant, for example. Absolutely. I mean, what we did at Sun Chow is think about the entire experience. Certainly you want to be able to grow food and do that at scale to supply local grocery stores and restaurants, 
but we also wanted it to be an experience. We're one subway stop away from Shanghai Disneyland. So this is a place where foodies could come, understand how food is grown kind of in the 21st century, what the future of growing food might look like. There could be local markets where you could get produce that's grown on site. There could be farm to table restaurants with celebrity chefs and, and make it part of this entire educational kind of food based experience. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that we were so focused on before the pandemic was the uh, the environment and how we were managing our climate. And so one of the things that um, if one of my team members could put up the link to James Miner's TED Talk, where he talks about food coming from all part, parts of the country, right? Could you talk to us about how it's set up now, why that doesn't work, even from a sustainability standpoint, and what we could be thinking about here in Boston? Yeah, it, it's amazing. You know, humans have been farming for 10,000 years, and we've been basically doing it the same way ever since until about the last 100 years or so, uh, when we decided to have big commercial corporate farms. And mm -hmm. most of those kind of, again, in the Midwest, in California, places like that. That's made our farming system completely unsustainable. Uh, a lot of the forests, whether they're in the United States or tropical rainforests around the world, are being torn down to support more agricultural land use. And so in California, as an example, around 80% of the water in California is used for agriculture. Cal California's Central Valley is where most of our crops in the United States are grown. We get, so Boston gets about 90% of, of all of our food from afar. Um, the world, the, most of the country gets about 92% of its strawberries from California, 90% of its tomatoes from California. Now, if you think about climate change and impacts of things like drought, which California experienced over the last three or four years, this is directly overlaying onto the type of land areas that we're growing most of our food in. So this isn't really the best use of those kind of resources. We're putting ourselves at risk. Uh, when these big climatic factors begin to shift these landscapes. What's interesting is that I didn't um, realize if you think about the drought in California, all that water is going into those tomatoes and lettuce and strawberries and then being pushed out, right? And being delivered out. And then we're, they're getting on a truck with gas and then going across the country to us. And so that seems very uh, unsustainable all by itself. Absolutely. And that's just the embodied water within those vegetables. You know, anything from 90 to 95 percent of the vegetables that were being grown in California and shipping around the country is water, let alone the water it takes to kind of irrigate all of those fields. So uh, you understand why Southern California and, and places are in a water crisis and why there are so many battles around water and how it's used on the Colorado River between uh, upstream states in California. So here we're going to focus on Boston in particular today. Sometimes we focus on the whole country and sometimes we focus on even other parts of the world. But today, focusing on Boston, we're a little behind some of the other areas, not just of the world, but even San Francisco, for example, where they're starting to do this. And you said Amazon has an investment in one of the groups. That's right. So there are a number of cities, both in the U.S. and internationally, that are starting to practice vertical indoor agriculture. Um, in the Bay Area is a great example. There's a, a company called Plenty, which received about $100 million in seed funds from Amazon. Um, in Newark, New Jersey, there's a company called Aero Farms who are producing a lot of leafy greens uh, for the New York area. Um, and in Singapore, there's a company named Sky Greens. So there are innovative cities that are starting to look at these things. Um, and I think Boston is, is lagging a little bit. Um, in Singapore, there's actually a, a Singapore food agency. And just yesterday, they released a request for proposals for all of the public housing in Singapore to transition their car parks and their roof decks to urban agriculture with the goal of 30% of all the food eaten in Singapore to be grown in Singapore by 2030. Now, that's a lofty goal, goal but other cities in the US are also starting to think of that. There are three cities Atlanta, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C., who have urban agriculture directors who are actually drafting food policy for how these cities will integrate with agriculture. And so could we, um, could you give us a couple of examples? So I'm thinking in Boston at Fenway, if you've all seen the gardens that are on top of Fenway Park, 
they they use those gardens in order to uh, provide produce for the restaurants that are in Fenway Park. But there are all sorts of other areas and ways, both outside and inside, that other areas are doing it, right? For example, utility space? Yeah, absolutely. So rooftop gardens, like you mentioned at Fenway Farms, are, tend to be the most traditional. This happens in a number of places across the country um, where, again, leafy greens mostly are grown kind of directly in the facility that's then consuming them. So at Fenway, they, there's a company called Green City Growers uh, who manages the farm. Uh, all of the produce then is gone, goes into the concessions at Fenway Park. So when you're eating a, a burger with a piece of lettuce on it, this is likely where it's coming from. Um, there are places in New York City, the Brooklyn Grange, which is growing kind of rooftop greens as well. That's fairly limited in the amount that it could actually grow. I think what cities need to do is consider multiple sources, not just one. So it could be a mixture of rooftop gardens, um, vertical farming, and also just traditional community agricultural space. I think one interesting thing that's happened recently in Atlanta is a partnership between the city and the, the private utilities there, uh, where the city is leasing the land underneath uh, some of the utility easements, whether it's kind of an underground uh, gas pipeline or an overhead uh, power line. That land, which is traditionally just kind of mowed lawn or, or meadow, um, not a very productive use, is being transformed to grow crops. And that's really important for kind of communities which have food deserts, which are essentially ac no access to kind of fresh fruits and vegetables in grocery stores or, or in a growing area. You know, the other good point that you have uh, made previously is that the food that is grown locally is also picked, it's more ripe. When it's picked, it's not being picked pre-ripening and you know, ripening while shipping and it's healthier, the nutrients are, there's more nutrients in what you're eating if it's picked locally and eaten right away. Absolutely, there have been a number of studies, Cornell University is, is doing one right now, where uh, as soon as uh, any vegetable is picked, it begins to lose nutrients. So as soon as you can harvest something, um, like these leafy greens grown in kind of a hydroponic growing environment, the faster you get them to the table to consume them, the more nutrients they, they hold. Um, so if we can limit the amount of time and distance between harvesting and consumption, it's just better, healthier food that we're eating. Sure. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Do you think renewable energy technologies will play a role in indoor growing? Meaning not using grid tied energy for lighting, and using either battery energy storage or other renewable energy? This is a That's a great thought. question. Great question. And it's actually one of the biggest limitations for indoor agriculture right now. So um, the biggest energy use is for the ultraviolet growing lights. Most of those are LED technology. LED technology is kind of improving exponentially to reduce the amount of energy that they're used. Um, I would love to see some of these facilities going off grid, whether it's uh, solar power or wind power. Um, again, that's all kind of location specific. But at some point, the energy demand of these LED lights is going to be low enough that you could source these renewable uh, energy sources for um, growing them. Absolutely. Right. And then, of course, there's all sorts of opportunities with new development. So with new real estate development, if there was an agriculture requirement for part of the open space, it could change how our open space looks. Right now, we've been super focused on beautiful perennial annual plants type parks. But that could be re-envisioned. And you know, I think about whether it's the Rose Kennedy Group, excuse me, the Rose Kennedy Greenway or new projects like a Suffolk Downs where they have open space requirements. Um, if we could pull up the picture of what you did in the Philippines, but if we could talk to that, how could that change too? I'm just I'm so excited about this, Michael. We could be we could be on all day because there's so many neat things that we could do. Yeah, I mean, and we could go down a number of rabbit holes on this as well, but I think what it fundamentally boils down to is there's a, a lack of integration or disconnect between you know, our agricultural lands and uh, our cities, which is where most of the people who consume the food live, right? And we've been kind of incrementally pushing that agricultural land further out. You know, when cities were dense before cars and people could walk to markets, all of the food was grown around the city and carted into this, the, the market center. Um, right. As we began to build suburbs, all of that agriculture is pushed out further. That's disrupting natural environments uh, and creating all of the habitat loss and fragmentation we're 
we're seeing not only in the Boston area and other U.S. cities, but around the world. And that's especially frightening when you think about kind of the Amazon and other tropical rainforests where there exists a lot of biodiversity that's being threatened. Um, mm -hmm. So we need to really rethink the relationship between farms and cities. And one way to do it is, uh, to your point, is to think about how landscapes can be more productive within the city. So if you're taking like a Suffolk Downs, for example, or any park in Boston, could there be a requirement, some sort of policy uh, that says so much of that landscape needs to be used for some sort of productive agriculture? Um, and it could be simple things like an apple orchard. Uh, it could be uh, more com community gardens. It could be more of a managed process to, to grow vegetables, to supply a local neighborhood. Um, but I think what we're learning, especially through this current pandemic, is our food supply chain is broken. And if there are more targeted ways within communities to start to repair that so that we have more locally sourced food and not having to rely on food shipped from across state lines or across international borders, uh, that enhances food security, nutrition, uh, accessibility to healthy food for all of us. You know, what I find fascinating about all of this is this is something you've been studying for years. You knew this could potentially happen. People have talked about things like this happening, and I don't think any of us could conceptualize it for real. Just like sea level rising. No one, maybe they, we knew it could happen, but then when it really started happening, it was like, oh, we got to do something about this. Same with the pandemic. We couldn't conceptualize this before. And now all of this is tied. So you've got the pandemic, which is because of now what we're going to talk a little bit about urban sprawl, right? And how we are encroaching on the habit, natural habitats of different animal, animals and species, how that can create pandemics. And it's all tied to also our, um, our climate change. And so now let's loop into that. How do we either continue on what we're doing and have potentially more pandemic related viruses or do we start doing things that help hinder that? And you have an answer to that. Sure, well, again, it all kind of comes down to food and how we organize our cities. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of think with our stomachs and whether that's intentional or not, or as overt, it really is a factor that's impacting all of us. So again, as we've kind of pushed development out, as cities are expanding, we've seen roughly in the last uh, few decades, 47 million acres of uh, rainforest land lost because we're pushing that agriculture out further and further. We're trying to feed more people in this traditional kind of soil-based approach that requires vast amounts of land. And so as you disrupt those habitats, uh, as you change the ecosystem, as you have a lot more interaction between uh, reservoirs of disease, which are in these kind of animal populations that have historically lived in these diverse forested areas away from humans, you're just increasing our exposure to these types of diseases. Uh, the mm -hmm. CDC actually did a study that says about 70% uh, of these new diseases that we're experiencing are zootonic, which means they cross over from animal species to humans. And as we kind of go into those natural habitats because we're sprawling, whether it be for kind of suburban development or agriculture, to support these growing populations in a traditional way, uh, that's where these conflicts are starting to have consequences. Right, so tell us, for example, they're going into bat caves, they're using, you don't use the word bat droppings, what's the appropriate word? For, for Guano is, is what we call bat droppings. Um, right, and they're using that for fertilizer and they're cross-contaminating in that way? Yeah, this is, this is kind of a, a traditional use of fertilizer in, uh, around the world, uh, Asia, Africa, bat guano is, is high nutrient and a lot of farmers will go into bat caves uh, and use that to uh, fertilize their crops. What's happening though is when you start to push into those habitats, um, bats, rodents, other species that again tend to transmit these diseases that are used to Kind of living away from humans and not having a lot of exposure to humans are now getting stressed as their habitat is decreasing or being fragmented. Um, when they're stressed, they actually shed more virus. So that virus is being shed into their droppings or uh, can, can cross over into kind of other species. And, and that's where we're getting these from, these diseases from. And it's not just COVID-19. Uh, it happened with SARS. It's happened with MERS. 
uh, all of these crossovers are likely a result of kind of habitat loss and fragmentation. Sure. And so one of the questions that we have is in support of vertical farms, especially in the inner city, uh, it's essential to have access to fresh food, which again, many people don't have that access. And the question happens, what happens to the current farms and farmers? Will, be, will there be more need for preservation of farmland so it's not gobbled up and developed? I think that's exactly your point, is that with urban sprawl, we're taking over too much land, whereas what we could be doing is being more dense in our space and utilizing that land also for the species that live there, right? Not just for farming. Absolutely. I, I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that the average age of most farmers in the United States is somewhere in their late 60s or early 70s. Um, mm -hmm. What we need to do is encourage a new generation of farmers to start practicing organic local practices or working in uh, entrepreneurial environments like a vertical farm. Mm -hmm. And so if you have these type of opportunities in the city, I don't think you're displacing any existing farms, especially no. because most of our farms in the United States tend to be these uh, mega corporate farms, right? Where they're, they're planting a single monoculture crop over acres and acres and acres. Most of that crop is actually not feeding humans. It's used to uh, create grain to feed animals, uh, which is a, an incredible waste of, of energy and land and water. Um, so if we're rethinking kind of where we grow the food, the purpose we're growing the food, um, and the types of food that we're growing, I think you can be much more efficient uh, with what humans consume in kind of an urban environment through this type of farming. And it's, it's really creating a new oppor opportunity for another generation of farming. It's a little more technically savvy, very different from traditional soil-based farming. Right, and actually food that's better for us because the food that is grown hydroponically has more nutrients to it also, right? Because my understanding from farming is that the topsoil is just getting worn out. They're adding fertilizers, sometimes organic, sometimes not organic, more artificial type fertilizers, right? And that if we can do this in a way that is not only better for the environment, not only closer to us, but it also, again, is better for us to eat at the same time. It just, it seems like such a no brainer. So we talked about cities often having a five to 10 year approach to planning. Right now, Boston's very, very focused on housing. If there's one thing that we've seen is that construction has continued outside of the outside of the city in order to maintain our need for housing, which of course will then need more food. Um, as we're thinking about strategic planning for greater Boston, not just for the next five to 10 years, the next 50 years, high level, Michael, you're put in charge of this, right? What, what would you do? I think Boston needs to start to develop uh, a food security plan in addition to all the resiliency that we're focusing on around uh, sea level rise uh, and impacts from climate change. So food is an essential part of that. I think it would be great if Boston did have an urban agriculture director who was focused, you know, working alongside others in the mayor's office, um, you know, around public health and those types of issues uh, as well. Housing, understanding equity issues related to food and food access. Uh, East food deserts tend to be in more marginalized, underrepresented, low-income communities. Um, so really, we need a strategic plan in the city. It also needs to be kind of a regional effort. We're not going to solve all of Boston's food needs just within Boston city limits. So it needs to be a task force that looks between kind of cities and towns regionally uh, to understand how we can feed the population uh, more locally and rely on less on other parts of the country and other parts of the world for our food needs. Right. And in the meantime, as we do look to some of these spaces that aren't being utilized or definitely underutilized, even if it's the next couple of years, right, while we still have to continue to figure out where this economy is going, there's tremendous opportunity to put some of these vertical farms in and create a way to draw people in once again, learn something, and also be able to feed our local population. I just think the entire thing is fascinating, Michael. You know, tying that back to uh, the, the environment too, right? If we can also decrease the carbon footprint of how much we're eating, because with more people, we're going to eat more. Another fascinating thing that you told me that I, I don't know that I would have taken so seriously three months ago, I would have been like, oh, that's interesting, is in the glaciers, as they melt, and I think this is something people really need to think about, 
they were, well, why don't you tell me, what did they find in the glaciers when they dug down? Sure, so there are some researchers uh, that were working in Tibet taking core samples of a glacier that's about 15,000 years old ice. And mm -hmm. what they discovered in those core samples was I think 26 or 28 uh, new undocumented diseases um, that we've never seen before. So, you know, the potency of those diseases, we don't know um, how they might affect human populations, we don't know. But the point is, in just this one small glacier, um, they discovered all of these uh, new diseases. So as glaciers melt, as climate change impacts all of us and, and global temperatures rise, uh, not only are we going to be impacted by these potential new diseases that kind of emerge from glaciers, we're going to see more extreme flooding, more extreme drought in all the areas that we've been traditionally growing our food. So there are risks kind of all around um, to our food security in addition to just our overall health from climate change. Right, and it's all tied. And this is a whole nother piece of the pie that I just don't think that the general population was even aware of and how it all tied together. And it could be a real whole circle of life or a circle of doom, depending on how we start to really take this seriously. And it sounds very scary to say it that way, but I think for the first time, the entire world population is on the same page with the, the holy of this whole thing and that we have to make considerable changes. So, well, you and I are here in Boston and we have one of the, uh, the well, I think of course one of the greatest populations of people, but we also have a very highly academic uh, population, very well educated. We have considerable resources here, and it would be great to see Boston start to be a leader in this and, and not think of farming as just what we do in our backyards in the summertime, but something that we could really use to support our growing population here in Boston. Michael, anything you want to add to that as we wrap up? No, thank you for that, Lisa. I'm, uh, I'm happy to take questions from anyone, anytime. Uh, I'm sure my email is on this, uh, or you can find me on the Sasaki website. So. It's a fascinating topic and I think it's something that uh, a lot of people are taking more seriously as they they know that we can no longer take our food for granted uh, in the future of uh, unfortunately of likely more pandemics. Yeah and one last question here Michael and I don't mind going a little bit over because we had a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a challenging start there. Um, are there solutions proposed for the production of meats as well? I mean that's another thing we've been really focused on is how much it takes to produce meat. And so you sure. have chickens, cows, pigs, thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, this could be a webinar unto itself, right? But most of that agricultural land is used uh, to feed cattle, essentially. And uh, all of that water that goes in and, and land required to, to feed the cattle that we eat in our beef uh, is really a, a huge resource drain on landscapes around the world. So if we're looking at alternative meat sources, whether it's plant-based protein or a combination of them, whether it's the Impossible Burger or something else, I think those will continue to be refined over time and, and become a better product. Um, but all of that will help to kind of limit the demands on uh, our water, our land areas, and, and allow us to hopefully reforest and, and have a more uh, biodiverse planet again. It's exciting stuff. I love working with you on it. Thank you for much, so much for coming on today and your flexibility with our, with our webinar here. I think we're going to have to have you back on when we have this all set. And I think uh, one of the things that people have been asking for with the webinar is extended webinar. So we'll do a 25 minute for people and then we'll stay on and do a further Q&A. And of course, all of our webinars are found on YouTube. So Michael, I have to have you back to, to do that with us. Um, in the meantime, today is, today, even if you're watching this in the future, this is taping on May 13th, Wednesday May, Wednesday, May 13th. And today is my dad's birthday. So I want to say happy birthday. happy birthday. And for those of you who don't know, uh, my father was diagnosed with stage four cancer earlier this year, and he's been a patient of Dana-Farber. And this week's webinars have been in his honor because we are really thrilled to have him here um, on his birthday today. And also we have Dr. Lori Glimsher, the CEO of Dana-Farber coming on tomorrow to talk to us about the fact that cancer also did not stop during this pandemic. And what have they done? Their extraordinary efforts to help keep their patients safe, also continue their research and, um, and work with their patients and their families during this time. You know, people who've been close to me know that we've done most of our interaction with my dad over video, over Zoom also, when we had planned on doing all sorts of family uh, 
sort of events and just things together. And so, and it's a challenging time for many people for many reasons. And last week when uh, Lori so kindly agreed to be on with me tomorrow, I thought, let's make a fundraiser out of this because so many of the hospitals doing such good work have been down on their donations significantly during COVID. And I am unbelievably thrilled to announce that we are at $16,000 today. Sasaki, Michael is also a sponsor. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, Michael and Heather Bajulian made a personal gift as a sponsor, Bullfinch, Calera Properties, Callahan Construction, CBT Architects, Cabot Cabot and Forbes, Commodore Builders, Kramer Advisory Group, Cross Point Associates, Design Farm Architects, Goodale Insurance, High Point Engineers, Janatronics, Building Services, The Richmond Company, and Sasaki are all uh, sponsors of this week's webinars. And so I want to say thank you to you. 100% of those proceeds went to Dana-Farber. And I want to say thank you to everybody for watching today. And please stay tuned for the link to log in tomorrow so that we can make sure that we're back on track normally and hope that you can join us with Dr. Lori Grumsher from Dana-Farber. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Lisa.